Um, hi, we are going to talk today about the Umbreca mullet. So what, what is that, you ask? It is angular up front <laughs> and Umbreco in the back. And it's, it's very educational. We're going to learn about angular. We're going to learn about mullets. And we might even learn about friendship. So uh, buckle in. It's going to be a great time. First, you know, we're going to talk about me. Uh, I don't know karate, but occasionally I pretend to on film. That's my various contact information. Uh, I'm a twin, uh, and the only real difference between me and my brother are dimples, uh, which is the only way my mother didn't get me confused at birth and from then on out. Uh, so I'm the cute one on the left there, not the less cute one on the right. Uh, I grew up in Cottonwood, California, which uh, is as much of a cow town as it sounds like. These were my next door neighbors, seriously. On every side of my house were cows. Um, Despite all that, uh, I am not a cowboy, as I proved at US Fest uh, earlier this year by falling off that in like seven seconds, I think, uh, hurting my wrist pretty badly. It was pretty hilarious. Um, for some reason, we couldn't get Pear or Niels to get on the bull after they saw everyone fall off and break themselves. But it was a good time had by all. And that's also a shameless plug. I'm also here to sell you guys on US Fest, which is in Orlando, Florida in March. It's really awesome. So I'll mention it a couple of times. But don't worry, we're going to stay educational. Uh, I'm also an award-winning cartoonist uh, in high school. Uh, for, my, uh, for, for a high school newspaper comic, I was second place three years in a row on the county level. But um, that still counts, right? So, so, so there's that. <clears throat> and uh, more importantly, I'm an Angular developer at Mindfly. Uh, my official job title is Code Humorist, but for some reason, customers never know what that means, so I have to put this on the business card. All right, so the audience participation phase. Uh, how many of you have uh, written code in Angular? Yes. We'll skip all that. No, just kidding. Uh, and how many of you have done so uh, before Umbraco 7 uh, brought out the back office in Angular? I know your feels. And uh, how many actually do Umbraco, uh, sorry, Angular coding for like front end purposes as opposed to just the back office? So sound cool, cool. That's okay. The rest of you will be all up to speed by the time we're done. All right. So we're going to start by talking about the anatomy of the mullet. It's a very important hairstyle, which actually has a much longer history than we all know or appreciate. Uh, we're going to get to that later, but uh, we're going to use this guy to help us get started to understand what we're talking about. We're going to call him Daryl. Now, there's two parts. As everyone knows, business up front, party in the back. Simple mullet, you keep those two steps, you're always set. Now, the Umbraco mullet, as I call it, is just flipping it. So you've got Angular up front, Umbraco in the back. Uh, so now we're all sold on that concept. And on the Angular side, uh, what we're doing is we're building a website where Angular is going to handle the views. It's going to handle the routes. It's going to handle the controllers and all that. So instead of having Umbraco do that for us, we're building a web app or website where Umbraco is just going to be handling instead the back end. So it's doing doc types, content, data, uh, models, and all that, but it's not responsible for any of the rendering or pushing it forward. And in between all that, Daryl's mullet is held together by a sweet face. Without that, it doesn't work. And for our purposes, of course, we're looking for you know, the uh, API layer, which is being handled with the Umbraco Web API wrapper on the back. And then for Angular, we're using the HTTP, HTTP object uh, in a service that will be communicating on that side. Now, why, you may ask? Why bother using Angular to do things that Umbraco can do just fine? You know, we've got CSHML views, we've got Razor, there's no need to have something else handle the rendering. This is Luke Rabluski, Rabluski, hard to say, and he talks a lot about mobile development, and he has a term that he uses called the mobile moment. And that's referring to this sort of moment in society where um, these devices that everyone's glued to are consuming a lot more of the internet than these. Well, okay, not a Commodore 64. I don't think there was very many of those on the internet. But PCs in general. So in 2011, roughly 300 million PCs were sold. 
In 2013, it was about 275 million, so it dropped. Smartphones in 2011, roughly the same point, was on parity at 300 million. Now, 2013, 1.25 billion smartphones sold. So that's a lot. A lot, a lot. So in a lot of ways, these are people's personal computers. This is what a lot of people now use to access the internet most of the time in their daily lives. And so, as he says, and, and, and when he's talking about the mobile moment, if it doesn't work well on mobile, your site's not going to work well. People are impatient. They're not going to stick around for slow load time, et cetera. So we need to start considering about the limitations that weaker devices or smaller screens have, or more importantly, data that's being carried on, like your 3G signal, you know, your allegedly 4G service that's dropping out all the time. And so we want to try to keep things as lightweight as possible. By the way, I really like this slide because you can start putting anything in his hand. <laughs> so I'm really hoping this is going to become the new meme. I don't know if you have Taco Bell here in Britain, do you guys? No? Yeah, it's, it's horrible. Uh, but we eat it anyway. Um, so yeah, so, so please feel free to put whatever you want in his hand. So I'm going to put that up later. All right, so as this sleepy corgi shows us, it can be really slow when you're trying to then deliver content via standard web page that's being generated in uh, MVC. You know, you've got postbacks in between actions. I'll slow stuff down when you're, format, when you're submitting a form. So the whole thing loads, comes back, et cetera. You've got razor and views, which razor is fine, but it can get messy, complicated, having to do a lot of lookups. And then generally the page load speed is going to be a lot slower because you're having to send the whole page each time back and forth. Now, as super fast Corgi is telling us, Angular gets rid of some of that. Uh, you don't need to do postbacks for most things because you can use you know, an API layer to communicate. Uh, the caching for Angular is tremendous, sometimes obnoxiously so. But uh, the HTML is all being stored locally. The CSS is being stored locally. So the next time you visit that page and the time after that and the time after that, the only thing that's really being loaded is any JSON or data that's coming through from your API. So it's very tiny by comparison. And um, the client's handling a lot of the rendering, the billing of the web page. That's happening on their machine. It's not happening on your server. So it's saving it from a little bit of extra work, and which can add up a lot for a very popular site. All right. And now we're going to talk about the Jackalope, which has no relation to any of that. But we're going to in a moment. So uh, in US Fest, the shameless plug, uh, we introduced some people to the jackalope. It's an American critter uh, that taxidermists invented that typically is a rabbit with antlers. But as you can see here, it gets really strange. The more bored they get or spare animal parts they have. Um, and then this was invented in the Americas in about you know, the 18th century. But it turns out uh, here in Europe, uh, this guy, Lepis cornutus, which looks a lot like a jackalope to me, was in uh, 15th century uh, history animal texts of this is a real creature, which kind of turned out not to be. And uh, then, of course, Germany has in the Bavaria district the Wolpertinger, which is like the psychotic mother beast of all crazy taxidermist animals. This was the most polite one I could find to put a picture up. They get pretty scary pretty quickly. But anyway, because it's an American critter, we used it to represent our logo last year in a conference. And so uh, we decided to create the Umbracalope which is just a jackalope with a cool umbraco symbol on it. It's another shameless plug. And uh, now I've decided to make a cute cartoon version of it. And we're going to uh, have an example application of making your own umbracalope that uh, will be uh, what we're um, showing on uh, how this could all work. We're going to give it a mullet because I don't want too many themes. We're going to try to keep everything consistent, so there will be mullets. All right, and we'll have something like this. You know, you're going to be able to build your own umbracalope. They get weird, so they can have their own horns. They can have their own heads, bodies, mullets, paws, tail. All different components that could be mixed together and created. And uh, to do all the communicating for that, when we're building this application, uh, where I like to start, honestly, with any kind of website that I'm making that does a lot of communicating between the front and the back, is I like to start with the API. Um, because that's where 
the back-end developers and the front-end developers come together. It's that nice juicy layer in the middle where they can argue over models over and over and over and over again. So it's best to get that arguing out of the way early for everyone's sake. Because when we're talking about an API, we're talking about communication. Um, between Angular and Embraco, in this case, if we're doing an Angular front end, you've got the Embraco API, uh, you've got models on both sides, because uh, you're going to want that data to look consistent when it's being passed. <coughs> Angular is using that dollar sign HTTP object to communicate, and uh, we're going to build a service that handles that for uh, communicating with the rest of the Angular code. And the layer that holds it all together is Ajax. And I don't mean the hero in the Trojan War, Ajax. I'm sure you all know. We're talking about asynchronous JavaScript plus H2, uh, XML, which I always thought was a funny thing to call it Ajax because it's really like, because it's not an and. I looked it up. They never called it and XML. They called it plus XML, but that's hard to pronounce. So that's probably why. But no one really uses XML for it anymore because it's, it's large, it's bloated, and instead we're going to use JSON. But for some reason, they never got around to calling it Ajax. So we still call it Ajax. We're using JSON. And of course, we don't mean JSON in the Argonauts. <laughs> Talking about JavaScript object notation, which is very easy to read. It's very compact. It's very small. And in this kind of application, the majority of the data that you're sending back and forth is just JSON. So it's saving your server a lot of communication. And uh, that means things will be faster. And on smaller devices or on things that are wireless, you're going to have uh, a lot less frustration for the users. I, I, I like uh, JSON a lot, which is weird to put next to this statue, but we're just going to move on. So earlier we talked about the anatomy of the embracolope that we're going to be building, uh, which has horns, head, mullet, body, paws, and tail. And uh, those will all be represented as a image of a compiled creature that you'll be able to create for your application. And we'll add in the description and the name because those are both convenient. So, um, you know, likes fish and chips, you know. So as an American, it gets confusing for us, chips or fries. I think I got that right. And crisps or chips. So I don't even know what we call crisps, so we're just going to move on. Um, and, we, and we're going to have different heads and different options. So we could have a Niels and Brackalope, for example, if we wanted. All right, and this is just an example of the kind of HTML it might show. Don't worry about that too much. It's just a sample of what that might come out like. Obviously, those spans are going to have to be placeholders for some sort of image object that will be overlapping. Um, or you could get fancy and do something like SVG. Have fun with that. All right, boring code slide. So this is what uh, all that might look like as a model that we're building in Braco. Um, Nothing complicated here, just a simple class. In JavaScript, unfortunately, it gets a little more complicated because JavaScript is kind of a special language, you know? It's not really the best for object-oriented stuff, so we're building this kind of more robust object because if you don't tell it that it has something because you haven't defined it, it won't know, it won't care, it'll make a umbracolope missing its paws and its tails, and then you have some sort of horrible abomination beyond what we already started with. So uh, usually I like to create my uh, objects uh, in JavaScript, my models, to have, uh, if it's undefined, it just creates a blank version of it. If it is being defined, then it just pulls through that version. And then we need to have a way to carry it back and forth, like a passenger pigeon. Well, that would be actually really slow, so we're not going to do that, even though it is a very evil-looking pigeon. Um, I included this slide because uh, Mindfly, Erica, some of you may know her, she's terrified of birds. So. Um, when I was running this presentation for them, she fled the room, so it, it was worth it. <clears throat> and so we're actually going to use, you know, the Microsoft Web API, which is going to build our JSON objects and ship it out, or, um, which is, uh, has this wonderful description. It's a framework that makes it easy to build HTTP services that reach a broad range of clients, including browsers and mobile devices. Blah, 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 blah. It just spits out JSON, and we're wrapped. Embraco with the Embraco Web API, which is great because it connects it to the services that Embraco has, so we can easily access our content, access our data models, stuff like that. And this is an example of what that might look like. This is a 
Umbraco API controller. Uh, in this case, an Umbracolope API controller. And uh, this is a very silly one because it's only got one method, uh, example endpoint, and it always spits out the exact same thing. So this is just an example. Um, <clears throat> and one thing to pay attention there is whenever you're making a uh, class for an API controller, you have to put API controller in it. Extend it out with Umbraco API controller. If you don't put in that, you won't do what you want. And then on the Angular end, got to communicate on the front side, we're going to be building a service. So a service in Angular is something that you can inject into the controllers as a hand, handy group of uh, isolated methods, basically. And this one's using the HTTP object, which is being injected in there, to uh, uh, handle the get or post functions that we're using to access that JSON with. And uh, this is just an example of what that might look like. Uh, I don't have the code yet up on GitHub, but we will have an example code on GitHub that's going to have all of this in detail, guys. So that way, if you're not familiar with it and you want something to look at more closely, you'll be able to see it. Now, HTTP is a cool object. It handles get, handles post. Um, I think it even handles update and delete. I haven't paid attention. I don't like using those methods names, personally. Um, and more importantly, it wraps all that functionality into a promise. And for those of you that don't know what it is, a promise is a uh, basically a great way to handle asynchronicity in JavaScript compared to, say, old-fashioned callbacks. You can write your code basically to do this, and then you have the dot then right there, and then you just keep everything inside it. And that way, JavaScript knows once it finally gets a response, if it gets a response, it's going to do something cool with it. And so by uh, in including that functionality in there, it means we have very little effort to get that going when we're calling it on a controller because it's going to be able to return all of that back out so it nests our promises for us. I don't know what was on this slide. It actually, I lost this between here and the US, so it's unintentionally blank. Um, we will assume it was a funny joke. Um, I'm sorry. I couldn't leave it blank. I just had to, had to put something there. All right, and uh, when we're doing these API calls uh, using Git or Post or whatever, there's a pattern that the Umbraco API always shows you. So it's always slash Umbraco slash API slash the name of your controller class that you made minus controller. And then the function name. So in this case, it was example endpoint. Follow that pattern. It'll always be OK. OK, so now that I've gotten you through that boring moment of learning things, uh, we're going to learn about mullets. Um, I've only seen this done once. This is a presentation within a presentation. And I broke it into two parts, but it, it's informative and helpful. So the mullet. Um, so MacGyver, right? You know, um, the mullet kind of hit its heyday in the 70s and the 80s. It's, it's, you know, synonymous with bad pink and blue and teal color combinations and really short shorts, stuff like that. But um, the name mullet didn't actually appear until the 90s. Uh, the Beastie Boys uh, had a song which they called Mullet Head, which introduced the concept of the word mullet for all generations to come with the following lyrics. Mullet head, don't touch the back. Cut the sides, don't touch the back. Cut the sides, don't touch the back. Cut the sides and don't touch the back, which isn't very clever as lyrics go, but apparently it's stuck, so repetition for the win. And when asked, well, why did you call them mullets? They said they named it after the mullet, which is a fish, not a pretty one, also known as the goat fish. So I guess they could have called them goat fishes, so that'd be kind of weird. And the reason they said it, and I'm not making this up, is because when a fish rots, or a fish like this, its head stays intact mostly, and a bit of the spine, but everything else kind of falls off, so you get that droopy effect. So rotting fish equals David Bowie's haircut, so I, and that's why we call them mullets which is also tasty, by the way. If we're talking about the fish, the hair is not. Don't eat hair. But the fish is tasty. So I don't, I don't, there you go. That's your first fact. Um, we're going to learn more about mullets later. So don't worry. <coughs> Part two is coming. All right, so back to APIs. We have it. We've made it. So we have the communication layer in our application. We're going to be sending JSON back and forth. That's representing the uh, umbracolopes we're creating. It's going to save it in the back end. And uh, then if we want to load any that we've already made, we're going to pull it back and forth. So we have our API to do that. 
but we need a place to store the data, the content, and, and not jars. We're, we're going to use in Braco. And we're going to build document types to do that. Or in my example, I'm going to. You could probably get a little fancier. Uh, but we aren't going to be using templates. Because again, we're not rendering anything with Embraco. So we don't need the templates. Just build the doc type and leave it as is. If you're doing the home page, <coughs> sure, maybe leave the home page as a template. So that way you can use that as where you're putting the uh, HTML to begin with. And then all your Angular views can load inside that. But for the rest of it, don't bother. Saves us a step. Uh, it's going to be nice and clean. And this is an example of what we're setting up. Just set up your properties that you need inside uh, the doc type. Um, again, we have all the bits we need here. The body, the head, the horns, the mullet, etc. And so nothing too complex there. Oh, and then a horrible code slide again. So now that we have it, this is an example of uh, inside that API controller we built earlier, a actual controller method that uh, does something instead of sending static data, static data. So it's communicating via examine with Umbraco, getting say, hey, I, I need this Umbraco lope, gets the information, and it spits it back out. And we're returning the object, which gets automatically turned into JSON for us. That's a little up close using the examine manager to do that. I learned about examine just this week, guys. So I'm, I, I figured out that this was the better way to do it. So, um, <clears throat> And then just an example here of getting the property values from that content that we built. It's pretty simple. Dot get property value. So, you know, don't have to work too hard on that. Now, uh, when I first built this application and I first built this presentation, I was using content service because it was easy to look up and read about and all that. And then I realized that it's a lot slower, so that's why I switched over to examine. Uh, the reason is content service searches at the database level when it's getting information. So it goes down, talks to the database, gets stuff done, finishes its laundry, and then goes back out with the information. Examine searches at the cache level. That's much, much quicker. So I don't mind using content service for updating or deleting or um, creating something because you're still going to need to make that piece of content. But uh, uh, use examine for reading. I mean, there, there might be cases where you might have some problems accessing a cache if it gets cached after you've made a change. But uh, in most of the things that I've done with it, it hasn't been too much of a problem too often. And I'm sure there's really smart people here that know how to fix it if it is a problem. But it's all for more speed, um, unlike trundling um, you know, hounds. But uh, the reason being, of course, we have small, lightweight devices that are now consuming a lot of the internet. The faster we can get things done and back, the quicker the user has it, the quicker they have it, the less they're frustrated, the more likely they're going to keep using your uh, website or application. All right, another boring code slide. So uh, this is an example then of posting. I just threw that up there. Uh, we're using, uh, in this case, like I said, the content service to post. Uh, Pretty basic uh, when you have a chance to read it in more detail. A little confusing from this distance. But uh, um, I wanted to make this one note. Uh, there's a save and publish. is something that Content Service has as a function name. You usually don't want to use that anymore. It's deprecated. You want to use save and publish with status uh, to avoid some problems with that. So just remember that guy when you're saving. OK, and on Angular now, we're, we need to build a controller now that's actually going to start interacting with all this data to do something. It's going to interact with our view. And this is a sample controller for our home page. So we're injecting in the scope. Uh, the scope is binding the data that we're going to have to the HTML view that we're making. And then we have that API service that we built. And we're injecting that guy in as well. Um, and this is just a basic example. We've got to create an uh, umbracalope function that we're going to be calling from an event on the HTML. And then just showing how that gets set in there. And inside that function, you can see we're calling that uh, post and bracket method when we're creating it. And uh, we're doing that as a promise. And then so that way we can wait for the promise to finish doing whatever it is once the uh, call's happened. And then we can do something else if we have any follow-up actions that occur. Inside the service, we've now written that function instead of the example endpoint one that we have there. And um, that... Uh, <clears throat> it's a, very similar to what we did before. We've got an HTTP post in this case instead of a get. 
uh, we're passing in the Abraclope object that we built. And then if we get a response, we're returning it back to the front, which is going to go back to the controller. All right. So uh, inside my example, I've got this down case properties function, uh, which um, I don't have here for you. Uh, the conventions of uh, JavaScript are usually, you know, camel case things starting with lowercase letter, you know, big case, et cetera. So, you know, like little dog. Uh, whereas in uh, C Sharp on the classes, we tend to start with uppercase letters. So uh, JavaScript is not a terribly intelligent language. It's not going to know that it's the same thing unless you tell it. So whenever I'm getting something from the JSON response, I always think, okay, let's convert this down to the normal camel casing so that way it's still matching the JavaScript naming conventions uh, instead of just having everything with an uppercase letter that will drive me insane seeing it back there. So I make a function to do that. That'll convert it. Uh, you don't have to do that if you just like throwing conventions to the wind and doing your own thing. No one will judge you until they read your code. Now, Embraco doesn't give a crap, though, uh, because actually when you're sending the data back, you can just leave it with the tiny name first, you know, camel casing. It'll convert it back itself. So it, it doesn't care. You don't have to write a similar function on that side. Uh, it is in Honey Badger happiness. All right. And uh, that's an example of actually starting the Angular application. If you've never actually used Angular, you're going to need to uh, create the app uh, that's uh, handling everything. Uh, with this angular.module method. And if you're injecting anything in, like routing, I've got the example there, ng route, uh, you can do so there. Okay. Um, data what? Oh, right. I had an HTML slide here. It went away. So um, a lot of you will see in, for example, the Embraco back office code where it's using Angular, it'll be ng dash something. And in a lot of the example slides I had earlier, if you were paying attention, you would have seen that I did data dash ng dash something. And um, so these two methodologies are both there. Um, oops, I'm missing more slides. They both work. Um, <clears throat> you can uh, do data dash ng dash something, and it'll behave just like a standard Angular binding. <laughs> uh, the reason that we do it, however, is, or that I do it, that I recommend it, uh, is because HTML5 spec basically says if you're extending uh, attributes with data or functionality, you should put this custom data dash in front of your attribute name. So that way in the future, if you create something that's going to last for HTML6 or HTML7 and, and your customer still hasn't updated their application, they haven't come back to you to fix it, uh, you'll find that what's going to happen is there could be the possibility that someone will start creating a new attribute name as part of HTML that your application now conflicts with. Now, it's very unlikely that ng dash is going to be used in the future. I mean, let's be honest, Google is a fairly influential company. Uh, they wrote Angular. So it's unlikely that we're going to see that uh, get reused later, as an ng suddenly means something else. But we don't know for sure. I, I have seen client sites that we made 17 years ago that they never change. They're embarrassing code, but they still work because we made them to be future-proof. They may not be the best websites at this point, but they operate. And so if we don't think about future-proofing our code by following these conventions, there's the chance, however slim it may be, that you're screwing over the future customer, which may be the first future view when they come back to you upset that their site doesn't work. Uh, and that's an opinion. Uh, I know that a lot of people like just doing ng dash and don't add the uh, five extra characters. Just take it, leave it. That's just my little evangelical moment there. Okay. So, um, however, um, as I said, ng dash isn't strictly speaking future proof, and mullets certainly weren't either, which is why we don't see a lot of them anymore, and why we are now going to go to the brief reverse history of mullets, part two. Thank you for holding in through this part. <clears throat> so, this is the mullet today. In the US, at least. The American South, hillbilly country, holding a dead goat. I, I don't know. It's, it's a colorful people um, with colorful car ornaments. And that's what the mullet's come to in the end of its lifespan. It, it didn't always used to be that way. Uh, in, in the 90s, country music was doing it. Billy Ray Cyrus, etc., with their achy, breaky hearts. And in the 80s, the girls were all hot and crazy about MacGyver and his paperclip. 
and it was popular with all these action stars. And then, of course, it's all your fault originally because in the 70s, Bowie and all of his friends were rocking that style, which means that we have him to thank for this. <laughs> Which is really unfortunate. Or so I thought. I've done some digging. And it turns out, follow me through, I, I looked at Wikipedia and everything. In 5th century uh, Roman Empire, when it was in Constantinople, uh, uh, Proc Procopius, a uh, historian, wrote about a movement of rebels and their hairstyle, uh, which uh, was cut differently from the rest of the Romans to stand out clipping the hair short in the front, um, front of the head, and uh, then letting it hang down at great length and disorder in the back. So that actually means that uh, as far back as ancient Rome, the mullet existed in some format or another. Uh, the style that these rebels was used was called the Hunnic style because they were patterning in it after Attila the Hun and friends who were an uh, influential chaotic force in that time. Which means ultimately Attila, in addition to destroying large parts of Europe, eventually gave this guy a haircut. And so that, that's the history of the mullet, is it goes all the way back to ancient barbarians and Roman teens who were having too much fun, all the way through Bowie to this. So that's the end of the mini presentation. We're going to move on. And we're going to talk about routes. Last little bit. So, as I said, Angular can handle routes. Route provider is the object to do that. Uh, you have to inject it in with ng route. It's not a core part of the Angular library. It's an extension. And say it, do it like that. It's not, not a difficult piece of code to write. And then that lets you create something like a, a router. Uh, so you do this dot win nomenclature. You can put in the URL you want. You assign it to a template URL for the HTML views that we're creating and then you can bind that to the controller that you want to use. And if for some reason someone enters in a crazy URL in your uh, website, you can always direct them to the home page or whatever you want with a redirect at the end. Basic, simple, handles uh, all the stuff that you would need from routing. And it's um, pretty slick. I, I like the route provider. I, I play around with it a lot. Uh, one of the fun things about it is route parameters. Uh, that is where uh, certain parts of your slash line sequence become essentially variable names, but instead of having that ugly kind of get, you know, thing of like question mark equals blah, 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 you can have it inside some sort of cool URL, like slash and bracket slash Niels, for example. And then the uh, ID that's being represented there gets passed into the route parameters, which we can then access inside our controller. This is an example of binding stuff on the front. If you haven't seen Angular code uh, in the HTML, you can do the little uh, mustache markup, as I like to call it. If you want to do some uh, text or something that's inside an element, you can bind your models to, say, input fields with ng-model. And then that object will then have it instantiated inside the scope on our controller function that we wrote. And then you can have ng-click or similar functionality that binds events that allows us to, say, fire those off as we go. So in this example primitive form here, you could write the name of your Embracalope, hit create Embracalope, it fires off that API call, goes and does stuff, comes back with a response, and the user doesn't get some sort of post back reload. You may want to have some sort of animation or effect to let them know that something's occurring, but uh, you don't need to have the page stagger, load, come back, and cause them to lose their place or just have to wait for that effect. People are very impatient, and this is one way to avoid that. All right, so we're going to go back to Daryl, and he's going to help us review. Bracco has doc types that we're using when we're programming like this, models, and API controllers. And that's all we need from it for this kind of way of doing web applications. Angular brings views, simple HTML, route provider, which is going to handle routing, and controllers to bind with the views, and HTTP object, which is bound through services to the controller 
and that's doing our API communication. And of course, an API in between the both, resulting in a beautiful Daryl face. And that's, that's our show. And one final uh, plug. So uh, that's the average temperature in March in Orlando. So if you're not busy on March 6th, and you're in Disney World for some reason, uh, we are running US Fest, which is our small little kid brother version of this that uh, we started last year. And so we would love to see any of you come and uh, have a great time. Uh, I have little cards that I can hand out for anyone that's interested in being a speaker that has the URL for uh, our call to speakers. We're still looking to fill in people on that and a diverse viewpoint. Even though we're holding it in America, we don't need only Americans talking. So if any of you are interested and have something cool to share, please come and check that out. And that's my time. Um, not currently. Uh, I think I recall seeing a picture of Rusty at one point, though, <laughs> our late developer, which is a little incriminating, but I don't think he let me bring that. Uh, I do at the college that, uh, you know, I, I do an event at a college, and I do see some people there, but not like a personal no, but I'm in the Pacific Northwest. We're about as far away from mullets as we can get, so I'm pretty lucky there. Oh, I got a question there? Yeah. I, I didn't do any uh, example tests, but since you're only firing through JSON back and forth for the majority of the calls, uh, you're, you're greatly reducing the size of the packets. So uh, I think on average you're saving maybe, I've seen stuff of like four or five seconds in some cases, and that doesn't sound, and it could probably be much higher. And four or five seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but nowadays I think it's like if you don't have your website loaded in five seconds, that's how impatient people are now. It's like, oh, it's taking five seconds. Screw this. I don't have time for this. Done. Leave. So uh, even that little bit of performance boost can help. And that's not counting stuff like uh, interactive objects where you're doing something, but it's not necessarily a page load, but you need to submit information to the back end. A non-web example would be Instagram when they do favorites. They show you the, the heart showing up right away. That's a lie. They're actually communicating after they've shown the icon, but they discover that users start pounding away on that button multiple times if they don't see it right away. So what we can do is we can say, you know, you hit a button to change something, the change shows to the user, or a pending change shows to the user, and then you go and fire off the communication to handle it while their attention is no longer distracted. Anybody else? Yes. I mean, you would have had to make the views anyway if you made them in Umbraco. And uh, you certainly um, might, if you're not familiar with Angular, find it a little bit hard of a startup. I guess there is a little bit of doubling up with the API, but I find in general that it uh, allows you to actually be faster in development because you can have a front-end developer responsible for uh, many things that sometimes they would need to tag in a back-end developer to get some help with for you know, doing some complex stuff with Razor and all that. And uh, so then you can just communicate on the API ahead of time, send your back-end developer off to his office, send your front-end developer off to his office, and they can build against that. And I find that in general, if they're staying in communication with each other as far as that layer in between, uh, it doubles your time, you know, your speed by just having them each take their own duties. Good? Oh, yes. What about, okay, so that's a good one. So the, a lot of people are afraid to use JavaScript websites because they're worried about search, you know. Uh, I can't say this is true for all search engines yet, but I know that Google explicitly now does JavaScript-based searching. So uh, in particular, uh, Angular is something that they had in mind when they added that feature. They're responsible for Angular. They want people to adopt stuff like this. Uh, they're really pushing it very hard. So uh, you will find that uh, in most cases, if you built your, your website correctly and you're not doing something really kludgy, it will index just fine uh, with search engines, despite having uh, JavaScript routing. What happens now? They're actually running a JavaScript engine inside their search. It's crazy. So with their indexer is firing JavaScript. You can actually tell it not to do that, but in most cases, it's not beneficial. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy stuff. Good? Golden? Ooh, yes. Okay, so, yeah. All right, so um, I'll be honest. A year ago, I hated Angular. Like, I hated it, hated it, hated it. And one of the reasons was, in my opinion, it's so hard to do fallback sometimes. You have this incredibly complex, elaborate JavaScript thing going on, and I love JavaScript. And then someone has a little JavaScript error, or they turn it off, 
You have nothing, right? That is a risk. You can build a fallback, of course. You could do something. Um, I mean, the, the level of complexity that you're going to do in it is going to be uh, kind of like an agency by agency decision. Uh, I find that nowadays it is an increasingly smaller percentage of people that don't have access to JavaScript working, and it's going to depend on the nature of your website. If it's a rich application, you probably are going to need JavaScript no matter what. But you can build simple post-back functionality into your forms and fields that will handle the majority of that kind of stuff if you needed to do a, a fallback situation. But then that is going to dramatically scale up the amount of effort you need to put in. But then again, if you're doing a really interactive website, you probably can't do everything with just the back end to begin with. So you're going to need some JavaScript. We good? Yeah? Great. Well, oh, okay.